Hi guys and welcome back to contract B. This is topic 7 and topic 7 is discharge of a contract. This is the first of a three-part series on discharge that we'll be looking at over weeks 6 and 7 and 8 and then we're on the downhill run towards the end of the unit and we cover remedies principally. So without further ado let's go to our prezi and have a look at discharge. And here we are looking at the death of a contract. And first up, I want to just do a bit of a recap here. So looking at the contract life cycle, you've done contract A, which was pretty much, you know, the fairly straightforward fun stuff, maybe. Mm, I don't know, it depends on your point of view. We looked at the birth of a baby contract. So we had a look at all of those foundational things that you need to get organized in order to have a legally binding contract. So all of those good things there, obviously offer and acceptance, uh, agreement and item, certainty, intention, consideration, and that features fairly heavily actually this week. Uh, all the different kinds of terms that you can have, things like capacity, privity. Actually, privity pops up in this week as well. So contract A is certainly not irrelevant, but it, it covered the more foundational things that you need to be across in order to understand how you get a legally um, binding contract on board. And then in B, we get to uh, cover all of the unpicking of a contract. So we've already had a little look at vitiating factors. We had a look at mistake, didn't we? Misrepresentation, misleading and deceptive conduct. Then we had a bit of a side excursion into a stop all, and then back again to have a look at duress, undue influence, unconscionable conduct, obviously, Amadio, Amadio, Amadio. Uh, and illegality and following on from there then we get to start looking at discharge and today we will be looking at performance and agreement fairly lightweight actually in comparison to the stuff of week seven which is discharge by termination and that's where all the lawyers make their big bucks because we start looking at things like repudiation and breach so that's a pretty important week that one then we move on to frustration which is just a you know it's a fairly nice light little topic to end off the discussion on discharge of a contract then we move into uh, remedies and the end of our time together oh dear hasn't that gone quickly so in terms of discharge by performance obviously if it's all good and the parties have done what they're meant to do, uh, exactly as the contract has described, at the times that the contract has described, everyone's going to be happy. You know, the, the performance has been uh, tendered and accepted by the other party and everyone's happy. <laughs> Uh, so the contract is discharged when the parties have fully performed all of their last obligations according to the contractual terms. If so, not a problem, the lawyer doesn't really get to make too much more money other than drafting up the contract itself. If it's not all good, okay, here I can see it is starting to prick up. The first thing we need to think about is time and date, okay? <laughs> Now we'll go into time and date a little bit more next week, but just so far as this week is concerned, if a date for performance is uh, specified and if it's essential and if the party has not complied with that term, obviously there's a breach there and you can terminate and sue for damages because it's a condition of the contract. If it's just a term, if it's just a, a, a non-essential term, obviously you can't terminate. You still can sue for damages if the lateness has caused you some loss. If uh, there has been substantial performance uh, on your side, then you might be able to recover the whole contract price if the performance hasn't been uh, as according to time and date on the other side. If there's no date specified, then it pretty much runs along the, the lines of uh, if you know there has been a date specified, but it's just a term, it's not a condition of the contract. 
So it just needs to be performed within a reasonable time. If there's no performance within a reasonable time, then, you know, it's the same thing. You, you can sue for damages, but you can't terminate. And, you know, if there has been substantial performance on your side and none on theirs, well, well none on time or within a reasonable time on theirs, then you might be able to recover the whole contract price. So that's just a bit of a placeholder, actually, for our discussions next week on time and performance according to time. Here is where we start to look at, though, uh, performance of the substantive terms of the contract. And there are three things that you really need to divide up your attention to this week. And what I want to do is just kind of touch on these uh, notions and then unpick them a little bit more. So there are three things that you'll, you'll need to consider. The first is the nat nature of the party's obligation to pay. And here we need to look at whether or not the obligation to pay depends on the other party actually having done something first, tender some services or deliver some goods. If that's the case, if they have to do that first before you have to pay, then the obligation to pay will be dependent on performance by the other side. So you'll say they're dependent obligations. If uh, it's otherwise, and we'll touch on this just a little bit more in a second, then they're going to be independent. So that's just one notion we need to be thinking about when we're talking about performance of terms. The next one that we need to consider is the issue of whether um, if there has been a failure to perform, you can recover the contract price. And here we need to look at contract terms and there are a couple of classes of contract. Now, some cases had talked about this as being classes of term uh, and their entire contracts or divisible contracts or entire and divisible uh, obligations. Okay. There has been talk of a third class, which is lump sum, and I'll go on to talk about that in just a minute. The last thing we need to consider is if there hasn't been any exact performance, uh, such as would allow you to recover uh, in terms of um, your purchase price or your contract price, then you need to ask yourself, has there been substantial performance in order to receive the contract price? Now, if there hasn't, and there's been part performance only, and you can see over on the side there that fourth little world that uh, is down the bottom. If there's only been part performance, then you're going to be looking at something like a quantum merit, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So just keep these three main ideas in your head as we go through, because they'll kind of interweave and overlap on each other, and you just need to kind of keep them fairly uh, straight in your mind as we proceed on these discussions. So, as I said before, you firstly look at your obligation to pay. Now, this you might be thinking in the back of your head, is this kind of distinction between independent and dependent obligations to pay, is this still current or is it more of a conceptual thing? Look, I haven't really um, come across any commercially uh, recent discussions or wars that I've had to fight over in my practice days uh, based on an argument of independent or dependent obligations but it is something that you need to have in the back of your mind because some of the case law does discuss this stuff. So looking at independent obligations, um, these were much more common in the olden days, uh, you know in the 19th century but uh, they are permissible under the sale of goods legislation nowadays and you know, I suppose that they could still happen. I can't really see why you would contract like this, uh, particularly if you were the purchaser, but generally speaking what you'll have is a contract where one party agrees to pay a price, the other party agrees to uh, deliver some goods and in the contract it will say that payment must occur on a certain date. And once that date actually comes, once that date arrives, 
that party must perform their obligation and pay the price on that date, irrespective of, of what the other party does, irrespective of whether they've uh, taken receipt of the goods, that your contractual obligation crystallizes on the date for payment and you must pay regardless, okay? Bit of a scary kind of a contract to enter. Like I said, I, I certainly haven't come across this kind of thing recently, but the cases do talk about them sometimes. So you need to know this is an independent obligation to pay. Okay, a dependent obligation to pay, much, much more common. And here, performance by one party is dependent on performance by the other party. You can't call for performance unless you've done your performing. Okay, that's the big difference between independent and dependent. Independent obligation to pay, you can call for performance even though you haven't delivered. Dependent obligation to pay, both parties' um, obligations are dependent on the other. So here when you have a contract for sale of goods, the buyer doesn't have to pay until the goods have been uh, delivered in accordance with the contractual terms and these are accepted by the buyer. Then the obligation to pay crystallizes and payment must be made. Um, <laughs> here we have uh, a very interesting example um, in the case law of independent and dependent obligations and I love this case, automatic fire sprinklers, pity whale to Gim Watson. In this case, a uh, rather charming little case which I'm sure you'll remember once we've uh, explored the facts. The facts aren't actually terribly well discussed in the case book so uh, I'll tell you them here. What we had was dear old Mr Watson who I like to think of as this rather portly kind of graying uh, little man with a well-worn leather suitcase. I have no idea if that's what he looked like but that's kind of how I see him in my head. <laughs> Uh, he'd fallen out with the board and they were trying to figure out how exactly they could terminate his employment. And what they did was they settled on advising him that he uh, was no longer fit to discharge the duties of general manager of the company and they no longer required his services. So on the 29th of September 1944, the wartime case, uh, they advised him as such uh, the thing that complicated matters was that there were some wartime regulations called the manpower regulations which actually disallowed the company from terminating its employees or changing around their employment. So there was that kind of complicated factor. The other thing was that uh, dear old Mr Watson, he backed himself, um, he just didn't want to quit working for this company. Please no! 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 And uh, he didn't accept their written termination of his employment as general manager and in fact he turned up to work every day and kept working uh, diligently for the company. Uh, there was found in the facts that uh, he did uh, discharge some of his duties as general manager, uh, others I believe just as manager. He had been offered a demotion to manager rather than general manager and that was meant to be a pay of £10 per week. But he turned that down, uh, rejected the termination and just kept turning up for work. Uh, rather delightful. He didn't even accept the £10 per week payment as manager. Oh no, no, that would be beneath his dignity. So he went there, he sat down, he did his work and he kept doing so for almost a year. <laughs> no pay. Uh, and then on the 19th of September 1945, those manpower regulations ceased to bind the company and uh, they did what I guess you would expect in that situation and they basically just locked old Mr Watson out of the premises. <laughs> so uh, couldn't get in, couldn't do his work for free for any longer. And the question was, uh, was that initial termination effective or in fact was uh, Mr Watson due to be paid a general manager's uh, salary uh, from the time between the termination and when they locked him out? Uh, was the fact that he kept turning up to do his work uh, sufficient to force the, the company to pay him for a general manager's salary? 
or was the termination effective? Um, Dixon probably gives the leading judgment and there is um, a section in the case book which I want to point out to you here. It's a good little um, distinction that's drawn by Dixon uh, as to independent and dependent obligations. And Dixon says, it is of course open to contracting parties to make what arrangement they will about the matter. They may, if they choose, contract for the payment of a sum certain at a time certain and make it clear that the payment is independent of the transfer of the goods. But that's not how an agreement to sell is ordinarily understood. And then he goes into a discussion of dependent obligations. And what he says here is, is quite important. He says, normally for dependent obligations, the promise is to pay over the money on the one side and when it's goods, it's to deliver up the goods on the other side. Now, it's not enough for the goods just to be delivered by the seller to the purchaser. What the purchaser has to do is actually accept those goods and that will crystallise the purchaser's obligation to pay the purchase price to the seller. And he says this is much like an employment contract here. What you have is a basically a seller of your manpower or employment skills uh, to your employer and if you deliver up your services to the employer that doesn't trigger the employer's obligation to pay you yet what must happen is that the employer must accept your services under the terms and conditions of your employment agreement and then the obligation to pay uh, crystallizes and you need to pay over the salary anything short of that the only thing that, the, in terms of a sale of goods, the only thing that a seller can do, even though they've delivered the goods but they haven't been accepted, you can uh, sue for the wrongful rejection of the goods here in terms of the sale of your employment skills and they're not accepted. The only thing that you can sue is for damages for that wrongful dismissal. Okay, so we have dependent obligations in an employer-employee uh, arrangement and there it was found. Now, there was an interesting, rather interesting split decision. Um, in terms of that original notification of, of termination of employment, you had actually two of the High Court judges coming down on the side of that uh, termination was effective notwithstanding uh, the manpower regulations that were on foot at that time. However, the majority did hold that uh, the contract was not terminated uh, originally because of those manpower regulations. But once those manpower regulations had ceased to take into uh, ceased to take effect, and the company locked him out, the contract had been terminated, and that's the way that things were uh, wound up. Now, there was a whole uh, heap of further argument in relation to what exactly the plaintiff should get there, but the point was the obligations there were dependent obligations. So that's independent and dependent obligations. And that's about where we should leave part one, a uh, good time to have a break, and we'll come back and look at entire and divisible contracts. So, see you then.